Diabetes Rasai. So I'll be doing this video presentation together with my other two group members. So basically, uh, this video presentation will be divided into three parts. The first parts will be delivered by me. The second parts will be delivered by Nur Ain bin Muhammad Sabirin. And the um, last part will be delivered by Prahadi Sabila bin Muhammad Azuran. Why Sexual Harassment Act? That will be the first question and relevant to us. Frankly, there will never be a precise answer on that question because it's so impossible to answer it comprehensively and fits the first idea that comes to people's mind when they first heard about it. Briefly touch on the skeleton, this act consists of five chapters, namely preliminary, offences, accountability, punishment and other pertinent matters. However, I will only explain on chapter 2 concerning offences. What kind of acts or gesture, be it verbal or physical, that will fall within the ambit of sexual harassment um, provided in this act? This particular chapter are divided into two, which what forms of act may constitute an act of sexual harassment, and another provision will illustrate elaboratively circumstances that is equated to sexual harassment acts. Crucial to note that these circumstances drafted may not be exhaustive and may not cover everything that is possibly regarded as sexual harassment. Thus, flexibility clause in these provisions has hard the court to interpret these provisions using a liberal approach which Sexual Harassment Act is not confined to those provided in this provision. For the jurisprudence analysis, both provisions inserted in Chapter 2 are mainly based on the sociological school of jurisprudence. As far as concerned, sociological school of jurisprudence talk about social phenomena where the law itself derived from the society, the people, not from the legislation. Meaning to say that law is formulated to govern the behaviour of the society, it works as a social institution where it will impact the society's level of discipline. Back to our provisions of the Act, it is an attempt to address on how sexual harassment acts might have occurred which adversely affected the victims physically and mentally. These issues emerged from people, therefore, law must work as a vehicle or social institution to respond to this issue, salvaging the affected people by satisfying the need of law presence to fix the issue regardless of genders and other related incidental matters in a way to include all probable acts to be regarded as sexual harassment, which will qualify those offenders to be legally sanctioned. Essential for me to highlight that the flexibility of these provisions is made purposely as this act is subjected to social changes, thus law enacted must always be adaptable despite any changes occur. Or if I could characterize it, it will incline to be a timeless law which is not restricted to a particular period of time uh, which might be irrelevant or harsh. In other words, if it is so rigid, then it will not respond respond to social act, uh, issue appropriately and it might be too obsolete to respond to those issues. Furthermore, this is what it means by one of the famous scholars of sociological school of jurisprudence, which is Ross K. Palm, as law made on sociological approach is an instrument to either balancing the conflicts or completing interests of people in the society. Putting it into perspective, the interests of the affected people suffering from sexual harassment must be upheld as their dignity are oppressed due to such acts. Therefore, law will come into play defending the rights of the victims by taking legal action to the offenders, humbling them down, impliedly saying both offenders and victims' interests are balanced through the legal actions. Talking about the Western jurisprudence, then we shall move on to the um, Islamic jurisprudence. It is alleged that um, Islamic jurisprudence also as related in this provisions enacted in the Sexual Harassment Act. Those provisions in Chapter 2 is enacted to elaborate on how sexual acts might occur within society and in what form sexual harassment can appear. Islamic law can be derived either by primary sources or secondary sources consisting of Quran, As Sunnah, Ishtihad, Masalih Rusallah, Istishab, and others. On that note, these provisions enacted based on Hadith and the Sunnah. This is substantiated by there is an Hadith by Tabarni saying that if someone's head among you is stuck by the iron needle, it's better for you rather than groping a woman who is not his own wife. In another Hadith, if you welted with the pig covered in mud and dirt, 
it's better for you rather than you lay on your shoulder to another woman's shoulder who is not your wife. Both hadiths picturize that sexual harassment or violence are disgusting and strictly loved in Islamic perspective. Through though these hadiths it seems to address when the sexual violence um, happened towards women, but it must be bear in mind Quran advocates equality between all and says that the only good deeds may raise the status of one human over another. In Surah An Nisa, verse 1 to 4, narrates that both men and women are spiritually equal. There is no such thing as restricted to only one gender and inclined to commit an indecent act. But probably around that time, there is so much oppression towards women that's explaining why this had to specify only one gender, which is women as a victim. However, in the present context, sexual harassment could happen to anyone. This chapter consists of four sections where first section, section 6 of these provisions, provides who can be the victim of the sexual harassment. Apart from that, under this chapter also, uh, we provide the procedure that can be followed by the victim in order to launch the report. This can be seen through Section 7 until Section 9 of the Sexual Harassment Act 2022. In my opinion, this provision was in line with the principle that being emphasised in sociological jurisprudence. Why I said sociological jurisprudence? This is because the basis of the sociological jurisprudence is to study law in its social settings. In other words, it can be said that sociology is the science of human behaviour. Thus, the principle of the sociological jurisprudence uh, is they examines the actual behaviour of the people including uh, such as judges, advocates, even the criminals and citizens while they enacting the law. The famous scholar of the School of Jurisprudence is uh, Max Weber that by examining the way in which the actual behaviour of people, we can reach the ideal norm of the legal system. This is what actually we do uh, or consider while we enacting uh, this provision or this law. While in the process of uh, enacting the Act, we found that uh, the sexual harassment doesn't occur only among the women or between an employer and an employee only. In fact, it can be happen to everyone despite of their gender, their age, their citizens, non-citizens, their races and whatsoever or whatever job you are doing it, uh, it can be happen to anybody. For instance, it can be simply happen while even you are having a chit chatting with your friends. Thus, by examining the behaviour of the society nowadays, we come up with this provision that covers the victim can be any person in Malaysia, despite of their background, despite of their gender, age and uh, their races. Besides, the sociological jurists also believe uh, in the solidarity of the society. This can be seen through their uh, famous scholars known as Emil de Kim, where he gives primacy to society rather to individuals. He regards society as an independent entity holding power over individuals. And this is what we practice while enacting this provision under Section 8 of the Sexual Harassment Act 2022, where we can see this provision allows other person to lodge a report on part of insane person. We believe an insane person also can be sexually harassed and thus the society can help them through their personal representative such as their personal representative which had been appointed by the court or even their solicitor. Other than that, we also follow the theory from the natural law where this principle believe that law and morality cannot be separated and it was connected to each other. And according to Aquinas, theory on natural law is good is to be done and evil is avoided. This is because he believed that it is the fundamental principle to maintain the morality in the law. I believe that sexual harassment was totally against the principle of uh, natural law and thus we need a law of provision to ensure that it will protect uh, one's right to life in the sense of their dignity and their reputation. Referring to the provision that had been enacted under Chapter 2 of the Sexual Act 2022, it suits with both of Islamic jurisprudence and Western jurisprudence. 
under Islamic jurisprudence, it suit with uh, the principle of Masalih Mursalah, where Masalih Mursalah literally can be understood as consideration of public interest, or it also can be referred to as securing benefit by removing the harm. According to Imam Al Ghazali, the benefit that intended by the lawgiver for mankind in preservation and protection of their religion, life, reason, lineage, and property is in accordance with the Makasid Sharia, thus protecting the victim of sexual harassment and providing a clear procedure to charge someone as committing sexual harassment in order to prevent from falsely accuse any innocent person or any innocent people, it can be said securing benefit by removing the harm. Thus, this provision treat everyone equally to secure their benefit, which their dignity and their life in line with the Makosid Sharia. Allah also said in Surah An-Nisa verse 124, this verse advocates that equality between all and says that the only good deeds may raise the status of one human over another. Thus, it can be said that what had been opined by the Islamic Jewish, which had been derived from the divine authority, was in line with the uh, Western jurisprudence. The Western jurisprudence, such as uh, sociological jurisprudence, tends to say it examines the actual behavior of the people while enacting the law. And that same goes to the principle of Masalih Mursalah. The authority provided based on the current situation of the society and ensuring that the society will get benefit by removing the harm. And that also what had been practiced under natural law where they emphasize that law and morality cannot be separated. Same goes to uh, what had been practiced under Islamic jurisprudence where whatever law that had been enacted it must be based on the Makosid Sharia. Thus, I believe that this provision under Chapter 2 of Sexual Harassment Act 2022 really suit and in accordance with the principle of Western jurisprudence and Islamic jurisprudence. On my part, I decided to talk about two chapters, Chapter 4, the punishment of sexual harassment and Chapter 5, the duty to ensure an environment free of sexual harassment. In this video, I intend to create an understanding of the necessity of this step along with the philosophy of Western and Islamic jurisprudence which are relevant. So let's get into Chapter 4. Section 10 of Sexual Harassment Act 2022 provides that whoever sexually harassed any person within the meaning of this act shall be punished for imprisonment not extending to 7 years or fine not extending to 10,000 or both. Next, Chapter 5, under Section 11 of Sexual Harassment Act 2020, it echoes the duty of a person in charge in any institution, schools, workplace, organization, or a public place to ensure an environment free from sexual harassment. Moving on to the next part of this video, which I will discuss the relevance of Western school of students that pertinent to this act and what provision represents the schools. Let's start with the positivism school, which view law as what it is and not what it is up to be. Besides, the other positivists, Jeremy Bentham, interpret law based on principle of utility and theory of pain and pleasure. In short, it means that the subject matter of law is the community and the interest will be preserved. So, the community's happiness will become the priority in the function of law and law as act as a tool to achieve the community's maximum happiness and pleasure. Based on both chapters, the law achieved the Jeremy Bentham's philosophy based on two reasons. First, it will bring the satisfactory to the community and to the victim since there is no existing law connecting the rights and punishment to safeguard the victim of sexual harassment. Second, the existing law under sexual harassment of, uh, in workplace and some provision under the penal code is limited and broad. As a result, the imposition of punishment and the obligation to ensure the place free from the crime will bring maximum happiness to the community. Now I will explain the reason why we put the provisions in the act. For chapter 4, the punishment, we try to convey that any person committing sexual harassment deserves to be punished. The existing law under the penal code is very limited to what constitutes sexual harassment, such as any act or intent to outreach the modesty of the person and is very limited to the scope of application. Section 509 only provides imprisonment for not extending 10 days and not extending fine for 20 days. Not to mention, Section 81C of the Employment Act only empowers the employer to dismiss, downgrade, or to terminate the employment. This is unfair to the victim because they need to bring a separate action to complete the wrongdoing. To conclude, punishment is relevant to 
give one to the coordinator who knows that the hill is at, has its own goal. Additionally, the reason why we teach the part in our campus is because to create a place that has minimum time to our sector. The victim must still see this in the flash from doing what is right. Necessitates the person who tries to create environment free from discrimination. This is because the offender tends to be manipulative and hides from its true color, and the people surrounds us inclined to not believe the victim, especially the woman. So the person in control have to take necessary steps in ensuring the safe place for the victim also. Moving on, this part of this video will talk about the correlation of the provision with Islamic jurisprudence. And the chapter 4. Fiqh or Islamic jurisprudence often described as human understanding of the divine Islamic law as revealed under the Quran and the Sunnah. It is a law revealed by the God, God to its believers. In Sharia, sexual harassment is strongly prohibited because it degrades human dignity. In the Hadith, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said that if you well put yourself with a pig covered with mud and dirt, it is better for you rather than you lay your shoulder on another woman's shoulder who is not your wife. Hadith for your example. We can see that Islam also considers sexual harassment as an offense and it has repercussions. The punishment of this crime under Islam is prescribed under Ta'zi punishment which is upon discretionary of the authorities because it excluded from the punishment under Hudu or Kisos. For example, Sultan Uthman had enacted law known as Katus. It relates to the Ishtihad which is another branch of Islamic influence. So the Ishtihad is to discuss and determine the suitable punishment for the offense after reaching the consensus of Moreover, the correlation between chapter 5 with Islamic jurisprudence can be seen in several hadith which promotes to safeguard one's best friend. Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him stated that whoever uh, saved the honor of his brother, Allah will save his countrymen against the blaze of fire and the day of judgment. Clearly, this hadith promotes the responsibility of the Muslim to preserve the, his brother's dignity, modesty, and honor. It is not to invite any evil intention among the Muslims to maintain the peace. It is corroborated with the provision to necessitate the person in charge to create an environment free from sexual harassment. In conclusion, sexual harassment is not a battle of the gender. Women are no longer perceived as the only victim in this crime because both genders are capable of harassing. In fact, harassment can be happened between same genders. This indictment will help to spotlight the voices to have a proper statute in administering the sexual harassment in Malaysia. It is to confer right to the victim, obligation for the bodies, and the punishment to the offenders. The scope of conviction also become wider because it includes an almost conclusive definition of sexual harassment which can be picturized in various circumstances under this act. Likewise, from the perspective of positivism, sociologists, and working with theorists, supports this motion based on different points. Not to mention, Islamic jurisprudence has been long educating the prohibition of sexual harassment in Al-Quran and as -Sunnah.